So these are part of the Swiss bank in your pocket Bitcoin hardware wallet, and they are totally useless. From the day that embedded downloads stopped supporting this device, they became totally useless. The funds in there were mostly unrecoverable, bad design. A really good example of why it's important to make sure that the wallet you are using follows open standards and that you are avoiding vendor lock-in at all costs. In this video, I'm just going to run through the installation use and a bit of a review of the Bitcoin only firmware for a Keystone hardware wallet, which is a great thing that allows you to use a wide array of different software wallets, as well as reducing the potential attack surface in terms of the software running on your hardware wallet. It helps boost your privacy in that you can have choice and control about who you're sharing information about your wallet with, including no one at all, if you want to run a full node. And it's also really useful in the event that if your hardware wallet vendor closes down or stops supporting the product, if you're not depending on any of their software at all, you can actually keep using the device safely and securely for quite some time, especially if the device allows it to run fully offline like a cold card or a Kobo vault. And if you haven't already done so, hit subscribe and that way you can stay in the loop for content I make to help you find your way in the crazy and often hostile environment that is cryptocurrency. So in this video, I'm just gonna run through a few things. I'm gonna run through how to install the Bitcoin only firmware on your Keystone. I'm also just gonna mention uh, how you can initialize your Keystone in a very trust minimized way, you know, using your own entry with Dice. And I'm also just gonna run through how you would use this device with Blue Wallet and Electrum. And I'm also gonna look at some of the advanced but powerful multi-sig features that are available once you're running Bitcoin only firmware on your Keystone. So if you're only interested in one of these sections, you can navigate using the chapter markers below or the chapter markers in the description. So here we have the Keystone. It's still running the Multicoin firmware and is actually in exactly the same state that it would be in if you followed my previous video on the uh, setup of the Keystone wallet, did the device verification and initial seed setup and just left it at that. So from here, we're gonna have to flash the Bitcoin only firmware. So basically just wanna head over to Keystone's website and we'll download the firmware. And we want the Bitcoin only firmware. Just making sure you're very clear on the fact that once you apply this update and you're running the Bitcoin only firmware, you cannot go back to multi-coin. So basically we will download that firmware if we go into our downloads folder, we can see it's just there. And look, we'll just go into Windows, right click and say extract all. So we can basically just go into the folder that is extracted. We just copy these files and we just paste them straight onto the micro SD card. And if you run into issues with this one here, that's basically going to mean that your Keystone probably won't read the micro SD card properly. And I've done a video that actually covers uh, some things to try if you're in that situation. And then we just put the micro SD card in the Keystone. The interesting thing here is that their website at the moment actually only has the 1.1.1 firmware, which the Keystone is not recognizing. And I think that's probably because I'm actually running multi-coin firmware 1.3 already. So we'll just go to the uh, Keystone BTC GitHub and we will just download it from there. There we go. And if we go into the folder that was unzipped, we have all the update files we need. So we'll just copy that, stick it on a micro SD, and then we just stick the micro SD in the device, which is a lot easier in the Keystone than it was on the Kobo. There we go. And it's basically immediately recognized that. And we want to make sure that the checksum is correct. Make sure the file is fully intact. So we also want to make sure you have your recovery phrase on hand, just in case the device is wiped. And we'll say update now. Enter the device password. Okay, so once that has rebooted and we've unlocked it, you will notice now that there's no longer a whole bunch of altcoins there, there's only uh, Bitcoin. And by default, it's choosing the uh, Keystone Mobile as the watch only wallet. So if we want to change that, we can just go into settings and we can choose which wallet we're going to use it with here. 
But other than that, all of the other settings are the same. All the other functionality is still there. Uh, it's just now a Bitcoin only device and we'll need the Bitcoin only firmware. All right, so let's just run through how to generate your own entropy. And that basically means using dice rather than trusting the device to generate you a truly random seed. If you go into the create wallet screen and you tap on this picture right here, one, two, three, times it will take you to the dice rolls page and the good thing about this is it actually allows you to use your own entropy in creating the seed phrase and what makes that even better is that the way that this is done is actually easy to verify using Ian Coleman's BIP39 tool. Now to be clear for most users you don't want to go entering your seed into a computer even if it's a secured environment like Tails but what you can do in this instance is you can actually verify the functionality of your device using Ian Coleman's tool and just using some test entropy. And only then once you're satisfied that it's doing exactly what it should do and nothing more, you can then go on to generating your seed. So basically we're going to Ian Coleman's BIP39 tool. We're going to tick, we want to show entropy details. We're going to select that we want to use 24 words and we're going to select that we want to use dice. And if we put the same entropy in here as we put in down here, we will actually get the same seed. And if we put that same entropy into Ian Coleman's tool, And if we scroll down here and I've entered the entropy correctly, we'll actually get the same seed. So if we just say recovery phrase saved and confirm that, if we then scroll down, so for an address that starts with a three, you're going to want to select this BIP49 one and you'll see uh, those addresses start with three. And basically uh, for addresses that start with BC1, I'm going to want to select BIP84 and you'll see that this first address right here is going to be the same as this address here. And basically once you've done this, you can satisfy yourself that the hardware wallet is generating seeds correctly from the entropy and the addresses you're seeing are the right ones. Obviously these tests will get invalidated if you update the firmware, uh, but there's nothing stopping you from just wiping the device and doing it again and just making sure that base functionality is there intact. All right, so let's run through using this with Blue Wallet. If you skipped the QR code that it gives you to uh, add this in the blue wallet, you just click on the three dots up here and we just say we want to export the wallet. And I can then just take blue wallet and scan this QR code. So I'll say add now. I'll say import wallet and I'll say I want to scan or import a file and then I can just scan that. There we go. Okay, wallet has been successfully imported. So now we have that wallet in Blue Wallet. And I've actually already deposited some funds in there for this video, and we can actually just call that whatever we like. Let's call it Keystone Native for native SegWit. And we'll just hit return. Now we could actually enable use with a hardware wallet here as well, uh, but it'll actually prompt us for that when we first go to send a transaction. So I'll just say save, and there we go. So that's Keystone Native. So we'll just say send and we'll scan, we'll just set something from the tip wallet. And basically we'll just send the maximum amount. Yep. And say next. So over on the keep key, we'll just hit scan there and we'll just do that. I have found it to be a bit fiddly with this. So one of the things that I have found to help is actually just to put the phone into uh, dark mode if your phone supports it. So we'll just put dark mode on and look, we'll just try to turn the brightness down a little bit too. Sometimes that helps. So on my uh, Android phone, this scans straight away, but on this iPhone, it is a bit touchy. So I want to hold it probably about 15 centimeters away. There we go. You can see it's in focus. There we go. And there are all the transaction details. So we can just sign that transaction. There we go. 
Now, if you are having trouble scanning the QR code, you can actually just export that to a file and uh, like send it to yourself and actually use the microSD reader on here to sign it. Um, but once that's signed, you can say scan, sign, transaction, or if we've closed it, we can just go back into the wallet, click send, and then we'll click these three dots up here, and then we just say we want to import a transaction. And we can just scan the signed transaction. Just say scan, sign, transaction. There it is. And if you really want to be sure again, you can just verify on Coinbin to make sure that everything is legit. There you go. You can basically just see all the outputs. And we can either then just submit it to submit the transaction through Coinbin, or we can do it through Blue Wallet. Send now. And there we go. Okay, so the next thing I'll show you is how you use it with Electrum. So the first thing you want to do is click on the menu, go into settings, and we're going to change the wallet type to Electrum. Now, the thing with Electrum is we can either use it with the native SegWit address, so that's one we had on Blue Wallet, but we've actually sent the funds away on that one. So we're going to click on the dots, and we're going to go back to Wallet Info. We're going to change this to the nested SegWit. Now, just to be clear, you can use Electrum on either of these two accounts. It will work just fine. But for this example, we're going to use nested SegWit. And we'll say Next. And basically, we need to have Electrum 4 or above. And we can just follow the instructions here, so we'll do that. So we'll go into Electrum. We'll just say new and restore. We'll just say next. And we'll say standard wallet. We'll say use a master key and then say next. And basically I'm just going to scan the QR code straight off here in a minute. There we go. So we've scanned that and we will just say next. And from here we'll say done. I won't worry about setting a password and here we go so now we can see that transaction that was sent to this wallet on Electrum and to send the funds basically it's similar to with Blue Wallet so basically we put the address in just there and we'll just say max and then we'll say pay I'm not in a hurry so I'll just say within the next 10 blocks and now I'm gonna say send and this is going to show me the transaction screen. So from here, I basically just go export and then say show as QR code. I can then just click scan on the blue wallet. And that is the transaction from Electrum. And if I sign it, so I'll just say tools, load transaction from QR code. If I scan the one off the keystone, and we'll just stick that in there. There we go. So that has found it. So I'll just say broadcast and that is done. All right, now the last thing I'll show you is actually how this handles multi-sig. And to demonstrate that, I've actually just created a uh, multi-sig wallet in Sparrow just using these uh, five devices here. And it's really just a two of five uh, wallet, just basically one that's uh, simple <laughs> for testing to make sure I can easily recover the funds without having to sign on all of them. So the key feature here is that devices like the Keystone, Cold Card, and Bitbox 02 allow you to register a multi-sig wallet on the hardware wallet itself, meaning that they will only generate receive addresses and will only sign transactions for wallets that you have already registered on the device itself. The reason why this matters is that for multi-sig wallets, the addresses that are produced by your wallet, including the addresses that are displayed on the screen of your hardware wallet, are not only produced using information from the hardware wallet itself, but are actually produced using a combination of information from the hardware wallet and from the software wallet, meaning that the software wallet can lie and you can end up with addresses getting displayed on your hardware wallet where you might be one of the signers, but the address might not actually belong to the multi-sig wallet that you think it belongs to. And unless your wallet supports saving all of the extended public keys and that sort of multi-sig wallet on the hardware wallet itself, securing multi-sig wallets in a way that prevents against malicious wallet software can actually be a challenge. Say I wanna receive some funds and I have this address up here, I can just go into that multi-sig wallet on the uh, keystone and browse it there. On the cold card, I can go to the address explorer 
and see it in there for that associated multi-sig wallet. On the Bitbox, it will show me that it's part of this multi-sig wallet that I've already registered on the device before. So I can guarantee that this address does in fact belong to that. Test multi-sig. On the ledger, you can't really verify the multi-sig details at all for a ledger and for a Trezor, the best you can do basically is to click on this QR code button and to manually uh, scroll through the XPubs and to make sure they are the right ones. So for example, what I've done is actually just swap the fifth signer on this multi-sig wallet that I had before. And you can see now it's generating totally different addresses. If I try and sign that transaction on any of these three devices, it actually won't work. It'll tell me that this does not belong to one of the multi-sig wallets that I've got registered on the device. Whereas the Trezor and the Ledger will sign it without as much as a warning and the Trezor will also quite happily generate a receive address and you'll only notice as an issue if you go through and check all of the XPubs. So there you go. The Bitcoin only firmware for the Keystone is really powerful. It's great in that it allows you to use the device in a way where you're placing far less trust in the uh, vendor for the hardware, which is always good, no matter which hardware wallet you're using. It allows you to also use a whole range of you know different third-party wallet software depending on on your needs and requirements and it also unlocks really powerful features like multi-sig the great thing with multi-sig is although it is complex and you know definitely uh, want to make sure you understand exactly what you're doing with that uh, before you start dabbling with it it's really powerful and the great thing about the multi-sig on the keystone is it's fully interchangeable with all of the files and things that you get from a cold card never mind the fact that it also plays well with a wide range of other wallet software I've actually now listed the uh, Bitcoin only keystone separately on my hardware wallet comparison website. And if you click through the detailed feature comparison, it's also been updated to include information about which hardware wallets provide additional verification needed by multi-sig wallets. And uh, all of the scores have adjusted accordingly. And you can find the link to my website in the description. So if you think Keystone would be useful in terms of securing your Bitcoin holdings and want to help me out in the process, there's an affiliate link where you can buy one in the description. Other than that, if you have any questions or comments specifically about the Bitcoin only firmware, you know, feel free to leave a question in the comments and I do my best to answer all of them. Thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful. Hit like if you think that other people would find this video useful and hit subscribe if you'd like to be kept in the loop about future content I make that helps people stay safe in the crypto space and to recover if they get into trouble. If you have any questions about this video or a topic that you'd like me to cover, just leave a reply.